to Franklin Covey's On Leadership podcast series. My name is Scott Miller. I serve as your host and interviewer each week. I'm also the author of the new Amazon bestseller, Master Mentors, 30 Transformative Insights from Our Greatest Minds, based on insights gleaned from our first 100 podcast episodes. Pick up a copy today. I think you'll find it to be a very swift, easy, breezy read. In fact, today is our guest's second appearance on Leadership. He also is featured as one of the master mentors. He is the serial entrepreneur, leader, father, coach, social media influencer, and multiple best-selling author, Dave Hollis, who is launching a new book called Built Through Courage, Face Your Fears to Live the Life You Were Meant For. Dave Hollis, welcome back to On Oh, Leadership. Scott Miller, thank you for having me back. It is always so good to be here, and I appreciate you and your friendship over time. So thanks, brother. I appreciate it. Hey, Dave, you know what season's coming up? Uh, get nervous about books being out today season? Well, a little bit bigger than that. It's winter, and Dave, oh. you know where I live, so where am I taking this, Dave? Is it time for us to finally get that ski date on the book, Scott? I think it's finally time for you to respond to my stalking of you. And not all your celebrity hanger-on friends, Kanye, whatever his new name is, and Kim, and everybody else, they can just stay at home in their 12,000 square foot cabins. And you and I, are, my sons, are going to go up onto the mountain and shred it. Perfect. I will uh, let the restraining order people know that they can uh, pull it down as soon as the snow is packed tight, and uh, we'll get it underway. Dave, it's great to have you back. Honored that you're here. You and I have been friends for several years, and I could not be more honored today to talk about this new book you have coming out called Built Through Courage. Uh, you're one of very few guests we've had back on multiple times. Uh, uh, what I'd like to do, Dave, is I'm going to episodically talk about some of the key learnings I took through your book. But first, I want you to take a few moments and kind of, will you, with some humility or lack of humility, whichever you want. Talk a bit about your own journey to reorient the millions of people watching and listening around the world, a bit of your journey professionally and personally that has led you now to the second of many books coming out from your machine in the coming years. Talk a bit about what your journey's been. Right on. So I grew up in entertainment. I had a 20 year or so career that had me work at 20th Century Fox, inside of a talent agency, grassroots marketing and touring talent, uh, and then had a 17 year career at the Walt Disney Company. And as much as I built myself a, a very successful career over the course of time at Disney, I went from brand assistant to head of sales inside the movie studio. I found myself near the end of that uh, window of time feeling like there was something of a disconnection between career and calling. I, I didn't feel like I was in a place where I could maximize the potential that I'd been given. I was under fulfilled, even though I had a job that was the dream job of many. And so I chose change. I made a big shift from corporate life to entrepreneurship and started building something with my then wife that uh, in the couple of years worth of time that we were together attempting to put tools in people's hands that if they were to use them, I'd afford them breakthroughs themselves, uh, it was jarring. It was disorienting. So many of the things that had worked in that old environment did not necessarily have application in the new. And yet there was impact for sure. But I also, again, uh, found myself in some ways in an environment that, well, I did feel closer to calling, uh, in some respects, the decision to join a company that she'd created that was based on a vision of hers had me still somewhat disconnected from what truly felt like calling in my life, which had me resisting but ultimately listening to that intuitive thing that lives inside of each of us that was, hey, Dave, rather than working in a business or for a business, might you, in fact, create on behalf of a business and uh, writing my first book and helming a podcast and doing coaching and the things that I now routinely do became part of what I do as I came back to what I wanted to be before I became who I'd become, which was uh, for most of my life, all of my life, a reporter. Uh, as much as it's not the news, and thank goodness for that, and it's unconventional at best, I take and report the experiences of my life and the things that I've learned from people like yourself and others and bring them to people in the hopes they can have breakthrough. But I found myself, uh, again, just in the midst of this transition from in the business to for the business, 
finding change, another constant in my life, this time change that chose me is uh, a marriage that had defined so much of my identity came to an end. And uh, this person that I'd been, husband to Rachel or partner of hers in a business, was now a thing that did not exist as of the middle of 2020. And so I was, in some ways, handed a blank piece of paper left to have this exhilarating and terrifying experience of drawing out what next looked like. And uh, in many, many ways, the benefit of a book deadline happening in the midst of what for me was my best and by far the hardest year of my life has so many of the emotions of processing change, whether it's the change you choose or the change that chooses you and how you have an opportunity to become who you were meant to be in so many ways because of the way you put courage to work through the conditions that you may not necessarily have chosen or that uh, maybe are a little more harder than harder to handle than you would have liked. Dave, you were gracious enough to be uh, featured as one of the mentors in my book, Master Mentors. You are mentor number three. I have also been on the podcast tour close to 70 in the last six weeks. Inevitably, a podcast host will ask me about you. Let's talk about Dave Hollis. And I consistently say, you know, I think it was perhaps Bre Brene Brown that popularized the safety around vulnerability. But I tell them I think it was Dave Hollis that made it a leadership competency. And so I, so I think through your podcasting, through your writing and your speaking and coaching, you have given permission to countless millions of parents and spouses and partners and friends and leaders to see leadership through the, through the lens of being vulnerable. I want you to bring that to life right now because you had a rough 2020, like all of, all of us did, but you know this adage of everybody was in the same storm, not everybody was in the same kind of boat. Well, you talk a bit about how difficult your 2020 was because when we had you on last on the podcast, you were just launching your book, Get Out of Your Own Way. You had a lot planned and not so much happened. And then, of course, there were massive changes. Will you just walk us through that litany of challenges so that everybody can relate to what is it like coming out of that? And here we are a year and a half later and you're on a significant rise. Give hope to people through your challenge and through leaving your safe harbor. Yeah, well, it's interesting. At the end of 2019, I made this very bold declaration that 2020 was going to be my very best year ever. I do apologize if I tempted fate or the universe and brought any of what we collectively had to experience in 2020 to bear. But uh, what I did not appreciate in the midst of that bold declaration was that I did not get a say in the conditions through which my best would manifest, would, would show up. And uh, as much as I, like most people, have zero appetite for reliving or experiencing again any of the conditions or things I went through in 2020, I do, 18 months later, to your point, have just now a massive amount of gratitude that I have become this person that I have become, my health, whether it's my physical health, but certainly my mental, emotional, relational, spiritual health, all of them, the strongest they've ever been, not in spite of the things that I have worked through and gone through, but because of the things that I've worked through and gone through. And so um, in so many ways, I have an appreciation, though I wish that my quota for going through struggle were gone or done. I feel full. Thank you. Um, it's, it's very likely that there is more hard times, uh, not just around, the, not, not just coming, but around the corner. And uh, having gone through, uh, you know, this divorce and identity challenge and the question of who am I now that I'm no longer who I've been, grappling with faith and what it means to have faith when things uh, that you have been praying for are delivered in ways that are different than you would have liked them to be delivered. Uh, I find myself now on this other side with a set of evidence that suggests, hey, when, not if, but when these hard times end up coming next, you know that there can be good that comes from that hard. For me, the, the hardest uh, you know, thing in all of it was just the uh, surprise, the not expecting something uh, like this to be a thing I, uh, in, in ways that probably took for granted, a marriage that I expected might last forever. Uh, when I found myself now not husband to her, not uh, someone who would continue to work in a business with her, one of the first casualties of that change was my imagination in that I had a really hard time casting a vision for what next would look like now that next was different. 
And most of that, as it turned out, was my fear compromising my imagination. And so doing work at the beginning around making a relationship with my fear, understanding what it was that I was afraid of and how in that fear I was believing things that were not true or because there were many things that were true, was not yet prepared to face those fears that were true that I would have to inevitably walk toward if I was interested in getting to the other side. And so it, it just was a, it was a journey of small steps at the beginning that became bigger steps over time. It was very much nonlinear in that there were three or four days in a row that were good. And then uh, a day where getting out of bed was the win for the day. I certainly at the beginning had a Cal Ripken-esque streak of consecutive days of crying that I, you know, one, just appreciate as a part of what it means to be human and the important uh, willingness to own feelings in the midst of processing grief. But so much of who I've become, so much of at the end of my life, when I am being talked about or my legacy is being discussed, the man that I've become at the end of my life in so many ways was born in 2020. And that birth in so many respects came because of how many important things in my life had to die yeah. in order for me to be brought back to life. And so uh, if you're going through a hard time, I just want to give you uh, a word that one, you're going to get through this. When you do, you'll have an appreciation for the strength that comes in persevering through hard things. You will have an appreciation for the grit and tenacity that you can command or the way that courage is something that you can summon, but also um, you're likely to, because of the way that these hard things that you're going through will break down muscle to build it back up, look back on this season as the season when you became who you were meant to be, drawn closer to purpose and more connected to who you really are, the, the capital T truth of your experience because of getting to know yourself in conditions like these. Dave, uh Stedman Graham is a good friend of mine, also featured in Master Mentors because of his place on the podcast, known to many as a very successful entrepreneur, businessman, author, and probably known to countless millions as Oprah's life partner of 30 plus years. And Stedman writes about, you know, creating an identity for yourself, not one that was perhaps, you know, foisted on you by others. And I have often recognized how difficult it must have been for Stedman, must be, to create an identity out of being, you know, the life partner of perhaps the most famous human being in the world. And I'm guessing, although, you know, your former wife, Rachel Hollis, was not Oprah Winfrey, in many ways she had an incomparable influence and fame and trajectory back during your marriage and partially to the company that you co-built. You shared a story in the book about how when you were at your first rise event in Austin, in the back of the row, and you were looking at kind of, you know, seeing your future, and then later you came to realize, you know, whose vision you were living. Will you recreate that story for us and what you learned from it and what our guests and listen, or listeners and viewers can learn as well? Yeah, so <clears throat> at the time, I'm working at the Walt Disney Company. Again, nice job. The, the benefits of working for a company where I was putting movies into theaters, the Marvel, Pixar, Lucas, and Disney films, greatest collection of intellectual property in the history of the movie business, um, left me because of the strength of that content, not in a position where I was needing to study to get straight A grades for tests. So I was looking for an ingredient, something that was missing in that current role that might fulfill me or fill me up, make me feel again more connected to purpose. I, I, I in the book, talk a lot about, I believe that each of us were given very specific gifts and that it's our job because of the specificity of the gifts we were given to do what we can every day to honor the intention of our creator. And I don't think I was in a position and a posture to honor my creator's intention while I was finishing my time at Disney. But I sat in the audience of an event that my wife had created called Rise. It was the first one. There were uh, uh, just a couple hundred people in a small ballroom in a hotel in Austin, Texas. And as I sat in the back, as a person who had long been her greatest cheerleader, I had a bias and an appreciation for this use of her gifts, the way that she in real time was honoring the intention of her creator, uh, but that also there was something happening in the room that I had not myself seen before. And in that moment where I was so interested in finding something that could connect to purpose, 
I, I said, man, I have seen, we were walking to lunch during the break in the middle of the day. And I said to her, I've just seen my future. I think that I have a set of skills that when paired with your vision, I, in like a rocket fuel kind of way, I'm an operator, integrator, you visionary, creative. I think together we could take this to a, another place, a different level. And so we did in combining superpowers have an unbelievable run. But what was interesting is it wasn't until the serendipity or providence of a plane ride, as it were, uh, about a year and a half later, where I was sat next to Dan Rather, of all people, Dan Rather, just to give you a sense of uh, how dorky I was as a kid, Dan Rather was my childhood hero. It also gives a little bit of a preview into how long it took me to kiss a girl for the first time in my life. But beyond that, I now was sitting next to my childhood hero. And he was generous in giving me two hours of his time while we had a conversation about the way that he was able to, in connecting to his purpose, live a life that was full and all these things. And I, in this conversation, was reminded of who I wanted to be before I'd become who I'd become. The person that at 19 at Pepperdine University was anchoring a news station, the, the person at 20 that was taking a 2 a.m. DJ time slot that just for the opportunity to learn the craft of broadcasting was willing to show up in a studio at any time, day or night. And in coming off that plane, there was this recognition that in some ways I'd been sailing off of someone else's map. That as much as I had a lot of pride for the work that I was doing, that I wasn't chasing my vision, but hers. And that again, this, this pursuit to honoring the, the gifts that you've been given or get closer to your purpose, for you listener, if you in any way have found yourself chasing the dreams of someone else or the vision of someone else at the expense of being connected to the voice that lives or sits inside of you at the expense of who you wanted to be before you became their partner, their spouse, their mom or dad, their employee, then you have some work to do, a little bit of a conversation of why you're here, not the reason why um, you've decided to pursue what you have. And there, by the way, was nothing wrong with uh, sailing off of that other map. As it turned out for me, uh, much of what I do lived adjacent to much of what she was already doing. Many of the tools and gifts that I was given in this conceit of wanting to be a reporter lived right across a smaller body of water. And I, the analogy I used is if we were sailing to Australia, my destination was New Zealand. Good news, I'd crossed an ocean and got closer to where I needed to be because of the benefit of chasing her dream. But the recognition of my dream versus hers has made all the difference in feeling the way I do about myself when I'm by myself. Dave, in our discussion thus far, you've used a lot of nautical metaphors. Your new book, Built Through Courage, is beautifully illustrated around this idea of sort of sailing through our fears into our courage. You have some ink on your arm. Will you show that to our listeners, read it for our, or show it to our viewers, read it to our listeners and talk about why that's so important to the structure of the new book. Yeah, I mean, this, this has been a mantra for me for the last four or five years. Uh, it's a John Shedd quote. It says, a ship in harbor is safe but that's not what ships are built for. And I got it as, the, as a reminder that the life I am interested in pursuing, that my want for connection to purpose, that the way that growth and fulfillment are inextricably tied, all of those things only exist outside of a safe harbor, outside of a comfort zone that I might want to stay connected to because of familiarity or out of the fear that you'd have to face in order to actually get out into that choppy water. And so the reminder is that one, uh, that's where fulfillment to, uh, or purpose exists, but that two, and most importantly, uh, that I was built for this, that I was built to handle those choppy waters, that the price of entry for the life I'd hope to live or the fulfillment I'm interested in experiencing, the connection, the purpose that I desire, the, the want for honoring the intention of my creator, that all of those things require that I believe enough in myself to put myself in the situations 
where that fulfillment or purpose or honor might come. And if you as a listener are looking for a single takeaway out of this conversation, let it be that you were built for this as well. The, the things that you fear, the stories that you believe, the way that you have potentially held yourself back or attempted to dismiss that voice inside your intuition, uh, as Glennon might call it, your knowing, the voice of God, whatever it is, uh, you, you need to become a truster of that voice, spend time to understand uh, what it is. And as it invites you, whether it's through fear or something else, to step into uncomfortable places, know that you can do it. But more than that, that you must do it if you're interested in the kind of growth, fulfillment, and purpose that you deserve in this life. Dave, as I was reading Built Through Courage in preparation for this interview, I found myself sitting in bed at night, which I often do when I'm reading these books with my wife, Stephanie, kind of just talking about things that I'm learning or things that I disagree with or just concepts, right, nuggets that are profound. And I was talking to Stephanie a few nights ago. I said, you know, I don't know what my fears are. I mean, snakes, sharks, and alligators. Those are my fears. I'm from Florida. Beyond that, I thought, you know, I don't know that I have a lot of fears, or if I do, I don't know what they are. And so I wanted to ask you, you know, you obviously have been on a life of, of, of self-discovery and journey. You've been the beneficiary and the evangelizer of the benefits that come from therapy. Uh, you yourself are a phenomenal coach. How does someone identify their fears and their own safe harbor? Because that's one of the first steps, is it not, to, you know, moving towards New Zealand versus Australia? Yeah. I mean, I, so much of our fear is wrapped up in our stories. So if you have an exciting idea about something that you want to pursue and your immediate first thought is why you can't do it, that is your fear. And, and understanding the story that you're believing that would represent why you are not currently in a position to take a step closer to that is the unpacking and discovery of fear. Uh, I, I did, to your point, because therapy has been such an important part of my journey of getting to know myself. I started a bit of therapy just in the beginning of this identity experience around divorce. I wanted to get to know who I was now that I was no longer who I'd been. And I started doing some work in something called internal family systems. It's a very interesting uh, bit of therapy in that the work is that you as self develop a relationship with the individual parts, the managers that exist inside your psyche, uh, your emotions. And that in that relationship, you get to separate yourself from being that emotion. You are the observer of that emotion. And so for me, when I experience fear or anger or anxiety, I am able now as self to ask that part, that manager, what role it believes itself to be playing, because that part, as much as it still may be a negative emotion, believes itself to be presenting itself in service. It thinks it's there to help us. So as a for example, uh, I have named some of my emotions. This will sound weird, but go with me in an inside out kind of way. Uh, anxiety, as a for example, is someone who I have named Clark. As in, with the glasses on, you are not Superman, welcome to the table, Clark. And I actually, when anxiety presents itself, invite Clark to sit at a table in my mind where we have a conversation. And so it goes something like this. Hey, Clark, uh, what's going on? Why have you shown up today? What are you here to help me through? And Clark will represent often my anxiety. And I'm talking situational, not uh, clinical anxiety, but situational anxiety. He'll say, you know what, Dave, I want to draw your attention to this area of your life where there is right now ambiguity that if you were to lend focus to it, might allow me to feel like my work here is done. Because that ambiguity is something that creates a role for me to play. And so in a wild way, when I get anxious now, I know, oh, Clark is interested in pointing me to a place in my life where ambiguity has overplayed planning. And the antidote to my anxiety, as is the antidote often to my fear, is a plan. And so now I am able to address this ambiguous place in my life with some kind of planning. Clark tips his cap, 
leaves my being. And in a bizarre way, I've now created a different kind of relationship that doesn't have me demonizing anxiety as a negative emotion, but as Clark, a part of me that shows up to help me draw focus to an area of my life that needs more attention. And you can do that same thing with anger or fear or any other individual emotion. And it has been a game changer in, a, in an untethered soul kind of way to appreciate that I'm not anxious. I'm the observer of my anxiety. I'm not sad. I'm the observer of my sadness. I'm not the thoughts in my head. I'm the observer of that soundtrack and get to decide which of these thoughts are real and which of these thoughts are not. And, uh, and you know, for anyone who is interested in getting to the bottom of what their fear is, I would start again with that conversation around limiting beliefs. Why don't you think you can pursue that thing you just got excited about? And then invite the fear that's wrapped inside of that belief to sit at a table and explain why it believes itself to be there. What was the source of the story? Does that source have credibility? If they do, do they have credibility on the topic you are speaking to them about? And if that credibility existed some time in your life earlier, right? So much of my programming came from my family of origin. My parents, good people, raised me from 75 to 90, right? Guess what? The things that were practically relevant between 1975 and 1990 most often do not have application in 2021. And I now get freedom because of an absence of credibility in the storyteller's timeline, not even so much the storyteller themselves. Wow. Uh, there's so many questions I could ask you. Dave, I think my favorite line in the book, that maybe I'll paraphrase, is you talk about this concept of being unapol an unapologetic advocate for yourself in general. And I, I love this idea because there's this genre of, not poppycock, but there's this genre of leadership now that says that, you know, all leaders must be humble. And your job as a leader is to lift everyone else up. And if you have any intentions to promote yourself, they must be nefarious. And, and especially in Utah, this is not an uncommon, you know, a, a thought. And I like this idea of being un an unapologetic advocate for yourself because there is a place where leaders and parents and spouses and partners and friends can both lift others up and shine the light on them, metaphorically, literally, but also on yourself as well. How have you come to sort of the nexus of both being a platform and a champion for others, but also making space for yourself to be a platform and a champion for your own needs, for your own dreams? Yeah, well, I mean, I think the headline is your work while it still can and should remain in a posture of humility, is to make yourself the only qualified candidate for the role that you believe you are suited for next and best gets you to who you'd hope to become in the organization or through growth as a person or in challenging you with a new set of skills that might come from it. And if you, uh, are, the, the way that I'd like to explain it and explain it in the book is if you um, had someone in an elevator for 60 seconds and you hoped that they might articulate why in that 60 second ride from the bottom floor to the top to your prospective hiring manager, why you are the only candidate that they could possibly consider because of the way that you are so qualified for and have had such a unique set of experiences around the work that is going to be called for in this job would that person be able to tell the story as well as you? And the answer to how they'd have to have been equipped is that your behavior in the workplace or interpersonally with them or the way that you were showing up well for others would have to have been so consistent that they have no choice but to tell the story that you'd hope was told. And so it starts in so many ways by understanding what you'd hope your personal brand to be. And then once you understand what you'd hope your personal brand to be, how people would know you or talk about you when you weren't there, what kind of behavior, what kind of operating principles, what kind of uh, North Star or personal values would you have to live into on an every single day basis so that the secret shoppers in your life, were they to peer in at any time, would walk away with that same conclusion, a conclusion that's aligned with your personal brand. You, you, you want to be able to advocate 
for your opportunities to fill the open vacancies in the organization that you believe yourself to be a fit for. And I don't think there's anything wrong with being an advocate. You care about yourself and your career journey more than frankly anyone else does. Uh, and finding a way to do it in, in so many ways ends up coming back to how your advocacy and your actions have been in integrity with each other before you make yeah. the suggestion that you are in fact that only qualified candidate that they should consider. Dave, there is a gentleman that we feature in one of our Seven Habits videos in our course called Stone Kimbati. He's a former member of the Ugandan Football Federation, was a Ugandan soccer star, and had an unfortunate accident where a opponent cut him down and did some damage to his leg. And Stone went on to become the model of what Dr. Covey would call a transition figure in our lives. And Stone said something profound once in my presence. He said, sometimes a disappointment turns into an appointment. And I often find myself sort of girding myself to that when something doesn't happen the way I want it to happen. So, okay, so why has that closed and what's going to happen next? True to your brand, would you be vulnerable and talk about the joy you have experienced with your daughter Noah and how perhaps that might not have happened had a previous adoption you and your then wife Rachel had very painfully struggled with? Will you share that story in the hopes to give people hope to perhaps a massive disappointment, perhaps even the loss of a loved one? And what yeah. might be next for them as they leave their safe harbor? Yeah, well, it's interesting. I, I write about an experience that I had very early in the divorce process where I had created a, a space out back at my house that I call my patio of peace. It was this attempt to connect to God and get back to neutral and find ways to um, just be a little bit more open to hearing the voice of who I am and who I need to be. And I was uh, sitting out there finishing up my time in prayer and in silence. And I happened to open up my phone to Facebook, a thing that honestly is the um, opposite of peace. But the on this day memory popped up and it was a mem memory from four years earlier where my then wife and I went to the hospital where we, uh, after having been a part of the adoption process in foster care for months and months of time, had uh, received a phone call saying that there were a pair of twins that had been abandoned at the hospital and that if we were interested in adopting them, this was our best opportunity for, uh, for bringing uh, new, new, new children, two children, uh, twins into our home. And as much as it was daunting and wild, we said, yes, it felt ordained. We had previously had a couple of um, other children from foster care in our house at the same time. So our home was available to two kids. It just, it felt like it was like, oh, this is the thing that is supposed to happen. And we brought those children into our home and we loved them. We named them. And about eight weeks into the process, it turned out that their adoptability had been misrepresented. Right. It's a it's a tough system, a broken system, really built on the back of, of so much tragedy and, and trauma. But in the in the hurry to keep them from being separated, an emergency placement worker had misrepresented their adoptability. And there was, in fact, family that uh, could adopt them. And yep, you know what? Uh, in, in foster, the, the goal is to always have children reunited with family. So uh, as much as it was gutting for us, the hope was that, of course, there would be a a happy ending for these girls. But I can remember how low we were in that moment for not having that chapter of our life turn out the way that we had hoped for. And I was brought back to what had happened just before I went out to that patio that night where uh, the daughter that we did end up adopting, one of the brightest lights in my entire life named Noah, was someone who I had just put to bed, just sung a song with, just had a conversation with a stuffed mermaid doll before we said our prayers and did our song and our secret handshake that only we know. And I recognize that, man, if I had gotten the things that I wanted, that I begged for and pleaded God for in that season with the twins, I wouldn't have just put Noah down. She wouldn't be a part of my life. I wouldn't know this thing that has become so bright. And so I find myself then in this season of, or this, uh, this ability to hold both, that I can both pray for those twins on an every single day basis, that they are in good hands and that it happened just as it was meant to, that there was something in the pain that we experienced that was preparing us to experience pain or handle pain in a better, deeper, better way. But that also 
uh, the happy ending is that we found ourselves finishing our family with exactly who was meant to finish our family. And if there was a thing in all of what has ended up happening in this last couple of years worth of time, I, uh, you know, I'm a person who's grown up in faith and have had a, a close relationship with God my entire life, never had my faith tested like this. And so what is faith if it's not tested? But in some of the most uh, kind of gut-wrenching moments of things not going my way, I had many of these moments of like, God, I prayed for these things. Why haven't you given me these things that I've prayed for? And I can tell you on the other side that uh, there's very much this recognition. No, no, no. You got exactly what you prayed for. You just thought that you had control over the way those things might be delivered. And so if you, again, are experiencing something that feels disconnected from your prayers, I hope that there may, in fact, be an ability for you to connect to something in faith, whether it's of a God I believe in or anything that you might that uh, we just don't have an ability to see all the pieces and how they fit together, but that there is in fact something that could, as time creates some objectivity, a way for us to appreciate the blessing of unanswered prayers and the way that things we don't have happen our way end up being absolutely 100% the thing that we need. Dave, let's finish off with this. You and I share many things in common. One is an appreciation for skiing together in Utah. Another, of course, is Ryan Holiday and his book, uh, Stillness is the Key. Would you send us off and recreate your trip to Tucson, Arizona, and kind of how you became in touch with yourself and the importance of how all of us should perhaps turn off our podcast and put down our phones and, and recognize the the, the value of silence and stillness. And you, what did you call it, your patio of peace? And, and That's it, right. And it, talk, talk a bit about the value of that. Uh, as our, yeah, as we send so our I, I, in the midst of making that declaration of my interest for my best year ever, uh, hey, it's the end of 2019. I've saved my best year for my 45th on the planet, 2020. Here we come. I realized that there is just so much noise that this world operates on that the only way I could actually hope to engineer that best year ever was if I was able to disconnect from regularly scheduled programming and understand what it would take to have that best year. So I left town uh, three days and you don't need three days. You could do you know anything just to get away. But for me, I decided, you know, I'm going to go sit on a rock in Tucson, Arizona, out in the middle of the desert. I uh, had an assistant on my team change my social media passwords and then deleted them from my phone because I know myself too well. And with a notebook, an interest in journaling where I was not a prolific journaler necessarily, I just sat and wrote. I wrote and wrote and wrote and let um, you know, the first 20 minutes of any session be a lot of the things that lived on the top of my consciousness. And then after 20 minutes, a surprise of what was actually living inside my unconscious now coming forward on the page. But when I was sitting there asking this question of, well, what's it going to take? How do I actually engineer this best year ever? The breakthrough that came being separated from a news business whose business model runs on fear. If they can make you scared enough, maybe you'll come back. Or the social media games comparison trap that has you always feeling like you're not going uh, as well as you'd hope or living up to the curated highlight reel of someone else. Or when marketing is infiltrating our thoughts all the time, trying to convince us that we don't yet have that thing that we definitely need to be whole. In the silence, I was able to hear this so, so clearly. I wanted to understand where I'd gotten in my own way, where any season of stuck had presented itself so that if I could, in seeing that stuck, engineer something that preemptively would keep that stuck from showing up in my attempt to create my best year. And sure enough, I look back five years, there was a single variable that was present every single time I felt stuck. And it was when the calling of my life or the way that I know I have talent and skills to show up for my life was disconnected from the way that I'd actually shown up in my life, right? There was this dis dissonance, this delta. Here's what I know I am capable of. I know I can do it at this level, but here's where I've actually shown up. And this space, this delta here, that's dissonance. That dissonance is where my shame, my lack of confidence, my lack of motivation, my critic thrives, my self-loathing, my love for self-compromise, everything. 
And so the work then that I am on a mission to do is close that gap. Because in every single time, every day that I'm able to create integrity between who I know I can be or who I'd have to be to become the person I was put on this planet to become, um, that's when I feel great about myself when I'm by myself. That's when I sleep well. That's when stress is lower, when I'm more motivated, I'm more confident, when I love myself. And when I have more confidence in the voice that I'm listening to inside myself. And so, uh, you know, that was a thing that was a byproduct of disconnecting from the busyness of our world, something I would not, I do not believe I would have been able to have that kind of a breakthrough if not for taking some time away from the noise, turning the volume down and listening, just really listening. Um, I now have a sense every day of, uh, what my work is to close that gap because of having identified where pain came from or the opposite of that, where um, the, the way I want to feel best about myself is usually found. It's found in integrity. Uh, and now I know what I got to do. Let's go. Dave Hollis, thank you for joining us. The next time I see you, we will be sitting outside of the Vouve Cluco Yurt next to the Montage in Deer Valley after the success of your launch of Built Through Courage. Face your fears to live the life you were meant for. Dave, best of success. The book is chocked full of amazing advice from Steven Spielberg and John Maxwell and people throughout your entire career. I love John Maxwell's quote, something on the lines of, if you want two days of back-to-back -back peace, don't become an entrepreneur. What was the quote from John Maxwell? <laughs> yeah, we were, we were, I was in real time. The difference between working at Disney where I had all these subject matter experts that had a nose for smoke. They could smell it before it turned into fire. And in this entrepreneur life, we'd never even smelled smoke. So we didn't know what to look for and fire was abound. I was with him one day and represented like, man, I am really having a hard time. I'm questioning if I'm cut out for this. It's just fires all the time. And he kind of laughed. And then in this stoic, I've seen this too many times kind of way, he said, Here's the thing, you can either have multiple good days in a row or you can run a small business, but you can't have both. Fires, you know, problems are the price of entry to learning from those experiences to build it into what you're meant to build it into. And in that permission, it afforded me so much grace to believe, oh, these things that we're struggling through are for us. We're going to become a better organization with better structure, people, systems, solutions for the customer, not in spite of, but because of the things that are happening. I don't like fire, but man, fire can be good if you can reframe it into the thing that you need. Dave, you are an energy infuser. You're an extraordinary author. Best of success with Built Through Courage. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Scott. I appreciate you so much. Thank you, listener. I hope that you enjoy this book. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. And pick up a copy of Built Through Courage by New York Times bestselling author Dave Hollis and my December ski buddy outside of Deer Valley. And we'll see you back here next week for a new episode on leadership.